best thing to do is probably uh, do the um, the intro. So we'll start with the class 13 founders, and then I'll turn it over to uh, David and Greg to do their intros and get started. So with that in mind, I think we'll actually, uh, we'll kick things off with Susie. Susie, do you want to do your intro? Hey, everyone. I'm here again. Um, I'm pretty safe right now. I'm in LA, to be honest. Yeah, I, I moved from Zhu from Oregon to LA last night. I'm pretty safe right now. Good to see you guys. And Eric said, Eric said he couldn't make it because he have another call. And uh, I'm be here for sure. Awesome. Well, um, just so David and Greg know, um, Susie is their um, marketing guru at Share, so she's probably the best person to attend this session anyway. So we're really excited to have her. Um, up next, I think we'll um, turn things over to Ignacio. Ignacio, do you want to do your intro? Yeah, hi, how are you? Um, I'm Ignacio Bermeo, CEO and founder of Trato, a blockchain-based contract management system that helps companies automate their legal process. Fantastic. And Mark, making sure to get the Lindy logo in. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so this is Mark, I'm the founder and CEO of Lendme. And Lendme is a subscription-based peer-to-peer lending uh, platform that uh, focuses on small amounts of money. Fantastic. And Travis? Hey, I'm Travis. I'm COO of Isogroup, and we're a no-code machine learning company and we sort of bridge the gap between machine learning tools and financial professionals and decision makers who don't right now have the technological expertise to use them. Fantastic. And then Jason and then um, John. Jason might actually be frozen. Uh, frozen. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine. I think yeah. I was frozen. Sorry. Okay. No problem. CEO and founder of Sabius, we're a payroll in your pocket application for freelancers to automate their tax payments to the IRS. And I have John Quill with us here as well. I like the I like that noise you made there, David. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I will uh, turn things over to David and Greg so you guys can give your introductions and then uh, take it away. Uh, go ahead, Greg. Cool. Uh, so we are Fulton Mecklenburg, and we are, uh, I guess, you know, at some point we were just a little startup ourselves, and we're still, you know, building and growing and, and creating, and, and, and both David and I uh, uh, became, um, we, we met each other working at a, a pretty large agency in uh, Atlanta, and, you know, we both have a lot of agency experience, and we decided after working for larger companies that we wanted to kind of bridge out and kind of start our own thing. We kind of reconnected after being, you know, going our separate ways for a couple of years and started talking about how we could offer our services to all different types of clients and how we could bridge the gap between a lot of the knowledge and expertise that you would get from a larger agency. And then also the kind of the hand holding and uh, personal guidance you would get from a more smaller agency. So we've, we're, we're enjoying being in this space and looking forward to sharing the things that we know about uh, advertising and branding and marketing and, and, and how to help you all take your businesses to the next level. Uh, good stuff, Greg. Yeah, so um, we um, really kind of operate out of three buckets, um, experience design, human-centered experience design, um, digital and social strategy and also content strategy and design. So um, that's the way we go to market specifically with our suite of capabilities and compasses. Um, but to Greg's point, um, we did kind of start off as admin um, uh, many, many moons ago when the Great River was just a small stream. Um, and as Greg had pointed out, decided to come together and start Fulton Mecklenburg. Um, we have been partnering with Q, um, Queen City FinTech um, for almost a year now, um, and this is our second cohort, and um, we actually um, have been working with a couple of guys from the last cohort, some, some FinTech organizations that are um, matriculating their way through um, the maturation process as it relates to um, capabilities um, around UX, and as, as well as brand, um, and as well helping them with their communications design. How do you tell your story to get people to want to fund you? How do you tell your story to get subscribers and users into your funnel? Um, all that stuff should be really top of mind, um, depending on where you are in your startup life cycle. Um, so having said that, that's who we are. 
Um, and um, I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to jump in. Boom. Can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. Let me do a couple of things here. So um, specifically today, um, we're going to really kind of chat about brand storytelling and content strategy, um, which we think are um, the pillars of uh, solid branding, no matter what your vertical, no matter who you're targeting, B2C, B2B, B2B2C, B2G, D2C, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's like electricity. It's a universal construct. Works the same way in Tokyo as it does in Kansas City. Um, and so brand storytelling and content strategy are, um, is, um, is a universal force, um, just like electricity or gravity. And so we're going to kind of show you some of the tenets of good brand storytelling and why, um, and also good content strategy and why. Um, and so again, we're going to talk about why brand storytelling, what is it, what is tone of voice, what's the brand purpose. Um, and, and then after you figured out that piece, then you're kind of really uh, in position to now start telling that story, becoming a brand content publisher, what's a content audit. Uh, we'll share our content strategy POV and also show you a construct for a content ecosystem. And so as Greg mentioned, Fulton Mecklenburg um, is a design thinking digital agency with top-notch creative. And so that's um, how we position ourselves. I'm gonna show just a short video here. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so my partner Greg and I, right, um, we were talking about how hip hop got started so many years ago. We were talking about Cool Herc, DJ Hollywood, and Grandmaster Flash, how they had to figure this stuff out on the fly. They had to get the records, they had to get the mixer, the amp, the speakers, the long extension cord from the street lamp all the way to their, um, to their rig, and then power it all together, mash it up, and then, you know, move the crowd. And we were really inspired by that history, and we were like, Wow, what if we could take disparate pieces from here and from there and from here and bring them all together and create something hot and new that was meaningful, um, that would actually add value, right? And so we were, when we were thinking about our um, fledgling agency that we're in the process of launching, um, Fulton Mecklenburg, we thought, yeah, we can do the same thing. We can take these seemingly disparate pieces, bring them together, mash them up, and make something new and hot that's really gonna move the crowd. So we thought, you know, user-centered experience design, crazy. Um, we thought digital and social capabilities that are really meaningful, that really kind of, you know, follow your customers or your users throughout the journey, right? We thought about, you know, quick turn, compelling content. And of course, you know, you know killer creative, right? All of it sort of within this agile sort of methodology framework, which hadn't been done before. And so when we mashed all that up together, we came up with Fulton Mecklenburg, right? Which is um, the new agency model. It's a, I guess you'd call it a design thinking, digital agency with indie film video production bones and agile DNA. Um, and that's really Fulton Mecklenburg. Um, it's a new agency model because the old one isn't working. You know, having been in the agency world over 20 years, you kind of see that, you know, that 20th century approach to helping brands connect with, with consumers and users is just kind of broken. And so we thought we'd bring together all those disparate pieces the same way Cool Herc, DJ Hollywood, and um, Grandmaster Flash did so many years ago, right? And so that's Fulton Mecklenburg. Um, hit us up on social and um, we can help you move the crowd. Old Mecklenburg. All right. Okay, so that short video is uh, sort of an explainer video. Really kind of um, give you some background into the way we think about our agency, the way we think about UX, digital, um, social, and content. And of course, um, you might have noticed this um, hip hop motif in our storytelling. And so, um, both Greg and I are hip hop heads from way back and continue to um, really enjoy the genre. And when we were starting our agency, we really wanted to tell our story um, through an authentic lens. And we also thought it'd be a great differentiator. And so um, you'll notice, if you go to our website um, and you check us out on social, you'll notice this hip hop mosaic, which um, really tends to differentiate us. And that's again, part of brand storytelling, brand purpose and brand positioning. 
um, a couple of clients that we've worked with. Um, we've worked with um, the Children's Hospital of Atlanta in a in a relationship through Aflac, um, Equifax, Verizon, um, BBNT, which is now Truist, and a small organization called Imagine Yourself. And we recently wrapped up a campaign with um, a not for profit organization here in Charlotte um, called The Relatives. Um, we, as I mentioned, we collaborate with clients to create video content that resonates with their audiences. We produce social campaigns that drive engagement and positive brand. We build apps and responsive sites, and um, we develop optimized, integrated, rich media digital marketing campaigns. So it's kind of who we are. So now brand storytelling. I'm going to turn it over to Greg, and why don't you jump in there, Greg? All right. So um, first of all, I did want to uh, jump back for a second in terms of what David was saying about our hip hop motif. Uh, I think if you, uh, you know, if you dig back into the crates of back in the nineties, you might find some old discs for David and I from back when our, uh, when we actually used to flow on the mic a little bit, but uh. <laughs> um, so it, it's in our blood. It's, it's, you know, it's something that we really believe in and it's very authentic. And the same the way thing about what we're a little bit about some of the things we're gonna talk to you about today especially when it comes to storytelling. Uh, part of my background is that, you know, I worked in entertainment as a, uh, I, you know, came up in advertising as an advertising copywriter. And before that I wrote, I was a writer in Hollywood and remember the Writers Guild and wrote sc screenplays and, and, and wrote for a couple of television shows and even wrote plays. So storytelling is something that I've been very familiar with. So why storytelling in terms of what we're talking about today? First of all, storytelling is a cornerstone of the human experience. It's through stories that we are truly that we truly construct our, our world. You know, in addition to the fact that we all enjoy sitting down to watch a great movie at the end of the day or on the weekends or getting into a, you know a uh, binge watching a Game of Thrones or uh, stories are in our lives or or even if it's just sitting at the door at the dinner table listening to a story that your spouse or a relative or somebody's telling about just a trip to the grocery store. Stories take advantage of the human cognition. You know, they build connections and connect contexts around facts in order to make them more memorable. You know, in fact, it's been story, it's been scientifically proven that stories are proven to get a person's attention. You know, in fact, stories can stimulate the neurochemicals, dopamine and oxytocin because dopamine is an adrenaline that release that drives us to take action and oxytocin creates an emotional connection that makes us think and feel and creates a more engaging experience. And uh, it's the thing that, you know, the stories drive action and create empathy and engagement. And it's done through the dopamine release that drives the adrenaline that gets us to take action. And then you have the oxytocin that creates the emotional connection. So it all brings it together and it creates an engaging experience. Now for startups, um, stories can engage VCs for funding and then it also can engage customers and clients for sales and business and to help grow your business. And the flow of a story helps us spot casual connections. You know, it, it kind of gets us to the root of the cause of an issue, it can be tricky, but our brains are hardwired to find connections between events. It really is the thing that draws us in and keeps us interested and it gets us to either take action or to just, you know, to join a club, to be a member, to sign up, to, be, to become a part of whatever it is we're trying to create. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. So, yeah, so let me see. It's ticking for some reason. Okay. I'm gonna just reboot that. I, I hate to break your flow. You were sounding so nice. Okay. So um, what is brand storytelling? Using a narrative to connect our brand to customers. There you go. Uh, yeah, uh, to uh, connect our customers with a focus on linking what you stand for to the values you share with your customers. I mean, there was a time back when we could just, you know, as an organization or as a company or as a brand, we could just say, hey, I make widgets, buy widgets from me. 
Well, in this day and age, here in 2020, you know, consumers, clients, customers, they all care about where your values are. And, and by sharing those with your, 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 with your audience, it helps bring people in and it helps you build your, that customer base. So, you know, the main character in your brand story is not you. We have to be clear about that. It's your customer. Your customer has to be the hero to make this work. And your brand becomes like the sidekick or, you know, like that secret weapon or the thing that helps you deliver or helps you, you know, helps fulfill the story. It helps get you through from one adventure to the next. Uh, so the customer is in control also in this day and age. The customer is in control of the path to purchase. Buying is now social. It's self-directed. You know, it's a trust-based and transparent. Because like I said earlier, you know, there was a time when you could just put something out there. You could put a message out. You could create your own storytelling and it was, or whatever your brand story was, and it was one-sided. You just put it out there and then people respond to it and then you move on. Well, now with the, of course, the rise of social media uh, and the digital atmosphere, everything is so much more engaging and so much more uh, uh, transparent. And consumers become, uh, they, they, they come in by, they join, by joining your, listening to your story, joining your conversation, and then reacting. And the way you respond to that is the way in which, it, which will determine if you're successful in that space or not. Uh, I know like in some of the social platforms right now, we'll, you know, we'll get into this a little bit more in detail, but like on something like a TikTok or on uh, Instagram, the faster you respond and the more you respond to things that you post, the more likely you are to, to build your audience because people see that you are a, you, your brand, that you are, you have a voice and that you're engaged with them. So uh, and, you're, and you're communicating that story to them. You're not just putting it out there and, and, and walking away. So ideally, you can encapsulate what you stand for in just two or three words. Perfect example of that is Nike. Nike's three words are um, just do it. Nike stands for athletic excellence, not just sneakers or sports equipment. Yes, that's what they sell, but they're more interested in empowering athletes and to do that, they've come up with these three words, just do it in order to get you to get out there and do it. And of course, you know, they want you to buy the gear as well. Uh, but it's what they stand for. It's more about their values. And you look at Disney, Disney's little short tagline is be our guest. Three words. And Disney stands for family, happiness, not just theme parks. And, you know, David and I always like to talk about this, the example of a brand that didn't quite get their story right until it was too late, uh, which is Kodak. I mean, Kodak, you know, for years, they thought they were in just in the um, uh, film processing business. They were into paper and chemicals, but it took them a while to realize that they are in the memory capturing business. Yeah. That's what people would come to them for, was to finding a way to capture their, men, their memories. And as that changed, uh, they were, uh, Kodak needed to change with the times. And, you know, the interesting thing that most people don't know about Kodak is that Kodak was ahead of everybody else in the digital processing business. And they even were, I think they even did develop the, they even created the first digital camera. They had the opportunity, but they made the decision that they weren't going to put all of their, you know, their, their focus on that. So, but their focus has been, you know, now that now they've, well, Kodak has kind of, you know, gone off, off the, off the rails. Yeah. It's but a carcass. Yes, but our point is that, you know, by finding what your story is and being able to encaps encapsulate that in just a really short phrase. And, you know, in the old days, I mean, you know, you talk to your David Ogilvy and those guys, they'll call it a tagline. Well, it's not necessarily a tagline anymore because you don't always need a tagline, but you do need something that your brand and your audience and, and your organization can rally behind. And last example on Disney is that be our guest? It's not just something that they say in the parks or in the stores. It's something that they live throughout the organization, from all the way down from the top, from the CEO all the way down to you know the guys who are working yeah. in the parks. It's more of a positioning statement um, that flows um, both internally um, and externally. And to, add, to kind of dovetail on Greg's point about Kodak, Kodak lost sight of who the hero was. The hero is always the user and the customer. Yes, and the idea um, is that if you're innovative, you want to, you know, obviously, you know, innovate in an area where customers are going to um, 
see value. Uh, um, and so um, that's kind of critical. So always kind of keeping the user and the customer being human centered um, in your approach, um, whether you're a B2B, B2C or B2B2C brand, whoever your vertical is being human centered and keeping the, yeah. the user and if you're, as the hero is critical. Right, if you're human centered, then as times change, as technology changes, it's easier for you to keep up or to adjust with that so that you're, you know, if you're always keeping this, the, you know, the customer, the, you know, the human experience at the forefront of whatever you're doing, it's easier for you to evolve into, you know, uh, I mean, you know, everything goes to, you know, it's going you know, digital and, you know, social this and whatever, but if you're still clear about where you're going and where, what you're focusing on, you can gradually make that transition with it. Good point. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the narrative elements. You know, by narrative, we mean the, the storytelling elements, like, it's, you know, and a story includes characters, you know, um, and to kind of translate this back into advertising a little bit, who is the main person in your commercial, your video, and um, uh, it includes settings, you know, you know, what is it going to look like? I, I, I mean, I worked in pharma for years, and, and, and we were always, you know, a lot of times you see some of these pharma commercials, and you, you know, and you think it's random, but we would always put meticulous like such so much detail in the settings that we would pick and the you know the the, the, the wardrobes and making sure the colors match the brand, all that setting is very important in telling a un, unified story you know the conflict i mean you take the the tide example you know uh am i going to get my kids clothes clean uh the conflict is that i don't want them to go to school with dirty clothes you know the rising action is you know um uh, what steps will I go through in order to make sure that my kids have the cleanest clothes? You know, the climax is that, you know, it comes out of the wash and it's, it's, it's perfect. It's not my, the, sh the shirts are nice and white. The socks are nice and white. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, the denouement is that, hey, here's this offer. Or here's where you can get it all. We've made it easier for you to get this product. So it's all handed to you in a nice, this gift, this nice little package. It's available at Target. It's available at Walmart. Or, so it's all part of this whole, the, these are elements of part of this whole narrative or part of storytelling. So leveraging these elements allows your audience to easily follow along with the story and remember it. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about brand tonal voice. Uh, what is the brand voice? The brand voice describes your company's personality. It's consistent and unchanging. And uh, the emotional inflection applied to your voice, it adjusts what's suitable for a particular message. Uh, and, you know, and another big part of this too, as I was saying earlier, it's being able to, uh, to speak and respond to the things that are happening. Uh, you guys remember the, the, you know, the great um, chicken sandwich wars between the brands uh, uh, last year where it was, or maybe it was two years ago, but I, it was, you know, between um, Popeyes and, and, and Wendy's and uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, the, the brands that won in that space were the ones who were able, who were clear, first of all, clear about their tone of voice and were able to respond and with a particular message uh, in, in the Twitter space. So you really have to be strong there to understand what it is. So when the brand voice authentically embodies its value with the right tone, the audience will emotionally connect with it individually and collectively. So here's a perfect example we have here is we're all familiar with in the web, on, a, on a website, we're all familiar with a 404 page. You know, you get to a page and it's like, oh, this 404, this page does not exist or page not found. Well, MailChimp could have easily put up just a basic 404 page saying this page that you're looking for does not exist. Well, they decided to, to take that one step further and, you know, and put a little brand in the end to it, right? You know, it, it, it's in their right tone of voice. You know, the, the page has disappeared and they've got the, the, their, you know, their MailChimp logo, the, their, their main character, right? He's like fading. I mean, so they took it all the way to the end. And uh, the, the thing I always like about this example is that it's a perfect example of bringing uh, all of the departments together because, you know, typically the, 404 page is something a developer will probably do at the very end and it's something that maybe the design team would not focus on but here the design team has clearly been a part of this and it's all the way it's, it's something that's where they're taking the brand tone and tone of voice 
all the way through to the end. And there's lots of other examples out there like that where a brand is taking the effort to making sure that their brand tone is present and on all touch points. So what is brand purpose? Every brand makes a promise, but a defining purpose is what separates them from their competitors. There's a functional purpose, a business reasons for the brand. We make widgets, we sell widgets, we do this software, we have this, we have this technology, and an intentional purpose to do good in the world. And as I was mentioning earlier, that's very important now because um, I remember uh, not too long ago, I was uh, uh, in New York looking at uh, doing a portfolio review uh, for the, uh, um, um, for MAKE, which is a multicultural advertising internship program. And uh, students from all over the country would come to New York and there were companies and agencies from all over the country. And it was, you know, this, this, this huge event. And I probably talked to maybe a hundred students in the course of the three days I was there. And the one thing that they all kept asking about was uh, things like in their own way, but you know, uh, basically, what is your company's purpose? What does your leadership team look like? They were asking a lot of valued and purpose questions about what your company stood for, what the company I was working for at the time. And so it's not only important to who you are in terms of helping to grow your business, but it's also important to how you bring people into your organization as well. So for example, um, the always campaign, you know, they you know, they had this very popular campaign, like a girl, and it's not just about them selling, you know, uh, uh, products for women. It's about boosting self-esteem. Uh, it's, uh, and then if you, if you look at Nike, you know, we talked about Nike a little bit earlier, you know, to motivate every athlete in the world, we believe if you have a body, you can be an athlete. Uh, and the same thing with Dove, you know, challenging society's definition of beauty. Again, beyond just selling a bar of soap, uh, they've got, if you haven't seen the you know, Dove campaign, they've got like a, a, a ton of great advertising work about how it's more important to, to look at women as a whole, as opposed to just saying, you know, hey, here's this product we're buying. Uh, you know, we're, Dove is really behind them, you know, having people define their own beauty and be proud of the way that you look and feel. So. Um, so per having an intentional purpose to do good for the world is, is, is very important. We're gonna pause there and see if there's any comments. Um, we know Greg um, covered uh, quite a bit here. He defined um, storytelling. He broke down the narrative elements of brand storytelling, um, talked about tone of voice and broke down the difference between voice and tone, and then talked about brand purpose. All these are foundational elements of um, strengthening your brand and also um, which will lead to brand storytelling. So if there's any questions and comments, we'll take a pause there before we jump into content strategy. Okay, we'll just keep rolling. Great job, Craig. I'm gonna uh, take the baton from you on the content strategy side. So becoming a brand publisher, wait a second, there is a little piece here. A little bit about content strategy. Yeah, so a good buddy of mine, a guy by the name of Jojo Brim, he's one of the greatest hip hop R&B A&R guys, A&R directors um, in history, right? So Atlantic Records, Def Jam Records, he's currently at Arista heading up A&R, right? He's worked with some of the greatest acts of the last 20 years. And it was a great benefit to be able to spend time with Jojo over the years and really kind of learn, you know, how he goes about creating and curating and cataloging content um, for various artists. And it's really, from his perspective, it's really kind of all about getting into the core of that artist and then creating content based upon that where they have authority to make content. So how do we go about doing that at Fulton Mecklenburg? Um, basically, we do a content audit. We audit all your content that's currently in the marketplace and we also audit some of your competitors. Um, we, consider various, we consider various touch points like um, CRM, mobile, search, video, gaming, social, 
um, AR, VR, wherever you've got content, we want to audit it for you to see how it's performing. Um, and then based upon how your content's performing, how your competitor's content's performing, we find white space for you where you have the authority to create more content pillars and to draw more folks into your experiences. Because without great content, your experiences are really going to lag. Um, after we've extrapolated some insights um, out of that audit, we create a playbook, your content strategy, um, in our content lab called The Mixed Down. Um, and then once we've got that strategy in place, we start creating all kind of content for you. Long form video, short form video, social content, GIFs, memes, um, gamification, um, um, infographs, um, display advertising, you know, all the above. So Fulton Mecklenburg, we're going to create curate and help you catalog great content. Um, hit us up online, hit us up in social at fullmech.com. Uh, Fulton Mecklenburg, move the crowd. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. So that's short video kind of gives a POV, a point of, our, our point of view around content. Um, and we have a very specific point of view around content. Um, in order to measure your content and see how well content is performing, you have to have a construct in place. I mean, you, you software guys know that. There has to be um, sort of rules and constructs in place to be able to measure against a criteria. Um, and so the holy grail of content for brands is to become a content publisher. Most guys, most brands lift and shift. They move assets from one channel to another. So for instance, if they have some content on their website, they'll repurpose that into social media ads or into an email drip campaign or into a newsletter or into a motion graphics video um, without a, necessarily a strategy and without the right content for each channel. So lifting and shifting is sort of where um, most brands, both large and small, operate. And then as you kind of evolve along that maturation continuum, um, you start to um, get to the next level where you can build based upon existing assets. And some folks will retrofit a strategy to match what they already have on hand or can be easily produced. That's a little better than lifting and shifting, um, but not necessarily um, leveraging your tone, your voice, or um, really amplifying your purpose so that you can create emotional connections with segments and individuals as they're going um, along the purchase path and looking to self-select and to become part of your funnel. Um, then, of course, the next layer is to develop custom content, to really be intentional um, through leveraging your tone and your voice and your purpose to create, curate, and, and collaborate, if need be, with influencers for, on, for, for content that's on purpose um, and actually made to move the brand ahead. And then, of course, um, really solid content brands like um, Nike or... MailChimp um, or Dove or Amazon or um, Apple, they tend to transcend um, and redefine a category, Lexus. Um, they're not necessarily um, only pushing their brand, but really tapping into the cultural zeitgeist of their audiences and really becoming a player in, in these, in these um, various audience segments, um, um, lifestyles. So, the holy grail is to become a brand publisher. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, but that, that is the true north. Um, lifting and shifting is where most brands are, and we hope to kind of um, share some concepts that might help you move that needle a little bit today. So as we mentioned in the video, it really all kind of starts with the content audit, a current state assessment of your content. And the, um, the key objective is to find white space. So throughout the auditing process, um, we'll evaluate your various types of contents and your tactics that resonate in, in, in your landscape. Um, this will help solidify strengths, um, identify and neutralize threats, and identify opportunities to satisfy previously unmet needs. And then of course, the needs of your target. And out of that audit, you know, it's always good to put a playbook in place. The way we kind of look at content audits is through this Venn diagram here. Your brand content, your competitor's content, and what your audience actually wants. And so you can see where they overlap here at this battle royal section. So you create brand content, your competitors have brand content, um, and your audience, B2B, B2C, B2C2B, whatever, 
they're looking to consume content to get their needs met. And it's in this overlapping opportunity where the battle kind of occurs. You've got to figure out what your business strengths are in relation to what your audience wants and also what business threats are out there that your, that your competitors pose um, that your audience also wants. And so we want to play to our strengths with our content and also try to mitigate our weaknesses um, with our content. Um, and again, it's in this area in the middle here that we try to uncover um, through, your, through your content audit that allows us to be really targeted on what people want and also leveraging your strengths while mitigating um, your weaknesses, which becomes a business threat. Um, and so again, this is sort of a great sort of framework um, to, to think about your content, the content landscape, and also what your various audience segments want. Now, obviously, your content is going to leverage your um, tone, voice, and brand purpose, um, but in a way um, that is obviously going to create hyper-relevance um, and credibility um, with your various audience segments. So, our content ecosystem POV, we think there's three types of content, basically. Superhero content, storytelling content, and scheduled content. So superhero content is large scale, marquee content that has mass appeal, even outside the target. You promote it, you go big here, maybe once or twice a year, promote it across all channels. Um, this type of content substantially extends and expands your reach and impact in special moments when you can afford to go big. Then there's the meat and potatoes type of content, your storytelling content, which is targeted and quasi-episodic. Um, it's found at the intersection of what a brand needs to say and what consumers wanna hear. There's a regular cadence and there's an editorial approach that drives repeat engagement. It can be short or long arc, um, but it'll always have a um, beginning, middle and end. Um, it should feel more sitcom and less drama, so more King of Queens and less Godfather of Harlem. Um, and the consumer um, may never even notice this a story. And so again, this storytelling content really plays off those brand storytelling skills that we were trying to build earlier um, in this chat. And then scheduled content um, for me is really the low hanging fruit, um, really kind of um, keyword driven content. It's always on, it's relation building content. It's born out of, it's born out of keyword research and performance data and it boosts the brand discoverability um, and um, helps to build post-purchase relationships with brands. So reviews, um, SEO and SEM type content, stuff that's going to be non-branded but keyword specific um, that's really gonna drive the discoverability of your brand. So within your content ecosystem, there's really three types of content that we consider um, that we think brands should consider as they're building out um, their content pillars. So we kind of break down how you should calibrate the content. So 10% of your content ideally should be superhero, 35% of your content should be storytelling, and 55% of your content should be scheduled. So again, superhero is this sort of large scale push content Storytelling is weekly or bi-weekly, it's targeted, it's quasi-episodic, cyclical. Um, folks know they're gonna get a video or um, an infograph or a motion graphic or something every two weeks from you guys. And they know they, they and that keeps them in your funnel and keeps you touching them. And then of course, schedule content is kind of daily, it's always on. You're pulling folks in, it's inbound, um, trying to get um, folks to discover your brand and it also builds reliability. Um, around the brand and, and, and goodwill. They can depend on you to teach them things through this type of content. Um, obviously owned, earned, and paid is the um, a good solid ecosystem model when you're thinking about content. So paid content is when you leverage a channel like BuzzFeed or HuffPost or Business Insider or Complex or, or even a social channel like a paid uh, campaign on Instagram or on TikTok. Um, and so the idea is to really drive traffic and, and awareness to an owned channel, which could be your app um, opting into an email chain um, or, um, op um, or to your website, a landing page on your website where they're 
um, is more content. Maybe there's a blog or some infographs they can download um, on your on your site. And also paid is also pushing content, um, also pushing um, activation through your earned channels, which are going to be your social media channels. Um, you're not paying there, but you are earning a, um, awareness on your organic social channels that are then, again, driving awareness and traffic back into your own channels. So content, all of it at the end of the day should be driving um, back to your own channels so that, you know, you can um, have these ongoing relationships and ongoing chats with your various audience segments um, as they are in um, various phases of their customer or, or user journeys. And that's it. We did it. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to pause there and stop sharing and see if there are any questions, comments, or concerns. I got a quick question on, um, obviously, I'm, I'm early stage, so we're not going to be at this level right now in terms of spend and budgeting when you're kind of running kind of at scale on this particular model that you kind of brought up. What are your recommendations? For, yeah, it's not a scale model. You know? Yeah, so again, it's wherever you are, as we mentioned, wherever you are in the continuum, um, the brand storytelling, brand voice, brand purpose, skills, you certainly need to practice them at in early stages because that allows you to then close the gap between you and larger competitors and allows you to be really smart about spend. So that's one. So the brand storytelling piece is foundational stuff. That has nothing to do with really spending media. Um, you wanna figure that stuff out prior to any spend. Um, and so once that's figured out, it enables you to be really smart about spend. And so everything's relative here. It's like electricity. I use that model a lot. You know. It's really the same electricity that's powering your house that's going to power up the football stadium. It's an issue of scale. How much do you need? Um, so the way I would look at this, uh, Jason, is through trying to get foundationally solid around brand. Yeah. And then once that occurs, you know, figuring out what your spend is um, and then being really smart about your um, around your channel distribution with spend, whatever that is, 100 bucks or 10,000 bucks. 10,000 bucks or 1.5 million. That you know, I've seen brands do a whole lot with very little. And I've seen brands be not very smart with a lot of budget. So because they weren't very foundationally solid, the uh, sort of the uh, moral of this story is, you know, be found, be solid foundationally. And then that'll allow, that will enable you to be really smart about your spend, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. That's really the key Thank here. Yeah. And you can yeah, apply those question. same you can apply those same percentages as David was saying. You know, if you whether you have a hundred dollars or ten thousand dollars, the same percentages he was talking about in terms of, you know, your superhero content, your storytelling, and your um uh schedule, what was the last? schedule, schedule. content, schedule. use those percentages to, to determine how you are going to allocate that hundred dollars or that ten thousand dollars. But, not, but those percentages aren't necessarily the dollar percentage, it's the effort and the time you put into them. And so uh, get that solid foundation first. And yeah, and, and production value. So yeah, if your budget's $100, then yeah, the production value of your superhero content or your storytelling content isn't going to be as slick or polished as someone who's spending more money. But the idea, again, as we talked about that continuum is that we're kind of building. We're building to get there. Um, yeah. And so, again, if, it may be that your audience um, also is, um, you know, not turned on by super slicked, polished ads. It may be that they want something a little more DIY and feel. I mean, so again, again, it goes back to hyper relevance around your audience. And so, in some of our in our first video we talked about that the agency model was broken and so something that you were kind of pointing out jason was reminiscent of how agencies work they want to charge you a bunch of money even if you don't have it um and we kind of thought that model was broken and so to greg's earlier point the idea was that if we could come in and, and empower clients with with knowledge transfer and the clients were smarter um just about how they went around their brand life um then you know hopefully when they got to the spend phase you know, they would be, um, you know, really targeted around that and, and get more bang for their buck. So that's really the, the value proposition of kind of what we're trying to get folks to buy into. So it's a different, 
go-to-market philosophy than most folks have been trained into. With those percentages, do you see them as at all flexible, you know, as you go on, like say you're launching a new product and you're reaching out to a new client base and you want to beef up that superhero content, is it okay to switch that from 35 to 15 or is that throughout the whole life cycle of the company you should try to stick to that? Yeah, that's a great question, Travis. Um, so when you think in terms of OKRs, right, um, objectives and key results, impact, right? So you want to tie your spend directly to how much impact do you think you're going to get so that we're not just doing marketing for the sake of mar marketing. We don't want to spray and pray. Um, we really want to be really laser focused. I mean, totally focused here. And so superhero content is good for launches. Um, I wouldn't suggest spending more than 12 to 13% of your marketing budget on superhero content. Um, I would shy away from trying to go big every quarter. Mm -hmm. um, you're really going to grow your brand. Your brand is going to get the most impact um, out of that scheduled content and that storytelling content. It's not as sexy. It is not, it's not as sexy, but you are going to see more impact um, over the intermediate and long haul. Now, you'll get a quick bump mm -hmm. um, in the shorter term with superhero content. You could even go viral. Um, but then will that be sustainable? I've seen a lot of things go viral throughout my career. Um, and, you know, it was the thing of the moment. But then there weren't these, um, there weren't this infrastructure in place that really lent itself to sustainability. So and, the answer is that, yes, you can be, go ahead, Greg. No, I was just gonna add to that. The, you know, is the, the key is to find that right balance too, because um, uh, like, you know, we were saying earlier, you know, you don't wanna just lift and sift, you know, you don't wanna just take, if you, let's say if you do have, you know, $100, $100 to spend on this really nice piece of content, you don't wanna just, you know, spray it everywhere. You want to, but then again, you don't want to do the, you know, you don't want to have it like, like matching luggage, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you are optimizing that spend or the investment in that piece of content. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that, you know, we've been able to do too is, um, is to understand how to leverage, if I'm going to spend, you know, X amount of dollars on this piece of hero content, how can I let, how can I have it? lift up the other areas as well. So, you know, I'm, am I tying it into search? Am I tied it into my storytelling? Am I using it in social channels in a different way so that it, it's connected? It's not just, you know, like I was saying earlier, it's not just all matching luggage, but I've strategically made an effort or I've, I've strategically planned how I'm going to make the most out of this one spin, this piece of, and that's why we call it superhero content as well, this hero content, because it, it's all powerful. It can do a lot of things. Uh, so, you know, that's something to kind of keep in mind too. If, if I'm going to spend this much on this piece of thing, I'm not just going to have it be a, you know, one trick pony. Uh, I'm going to figure out how can I, if I'm going to launch this, let's say, for example, I'm going to spend money on a commercial. Well, what else, on the day that I launch that commercial, what else is going to go on in my other channels at that time? How am I going to connect all the other dots and, and, and make sure that I'm leveraging the money that I'm spending on this commercial? And that's just right. And I, I would assume that also helps you not, like you were saying earlier in the presentation about not losing sight of the hero, like the current client. If you can keep it in all the channels, I assume, then you can like make sure your current outreach is still going out to clients and you're not losing you know, them because you're spending all on the superhero content going out to people you're not currently targeting. Yeah, um, um, I'll be right with you, Ignacio. I'm just going to respond to the last piece with, with Ignacio's had his hand up. Um, so, 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 yeah, Travis, the, um, the philosophy, right? So the philosophy of, I think, good marketing for startups and really nimble organizations like Amazon, for instance, even though they're big, they still think like a startup in a lot of cases. Mm. The way they go to market, um, very lean and very targeted. And so the old way of marketing, really the 20th century way, is broadcasting. This thing called the internet allowed us to narrowcast, to get really wide and deep within our very specific market segments and not try to be everything to everyone. 
um, but to be a real player to our legitimate audiences, audiences that we truly have the authority to go in and create a relationship with. So, cool. Ignacio. Thanks. Um, I, I would like to hear a suggestion about how would you approach a content when you target several markets at the same time. So in our case, our brand is, is targeting the, I mean, the service we provide is somehow uh, has benefits when you use it locally. So we have targets in, in Latin America, targets mm. in Europe and targets mm. in the United States. Sure. But at the end, we have one LinkedIn profile, you know, one LinkedIn for the company, which is the main channel we use in order to target new or, or provide content or that kind of stuff. So how would you approach that, uh, considering that, that, we, that it's like a different product to different uh, jurisdictions? How, how, mm. how would you approach that in terms of content? So um, it goes back to tone, voice, and purpose initially. So what is your brand voice? How does that translate into these languages and cultures? So you'd have to localize your approach, obviously, for each one of those regions. That's it. So I talk about market segmentation. You've heard me say audience segmentation quite a bit. So you'd have to have a segmented approach for each one of those audiences that were still um, the... Um, the descendant of your brand voice, that your brand voice was still powering this. But it, it have to make sense. So it has to be localized is my point, right? So the same thing in the user experience, if you have a, an app that operates in several countries, um, you have to localize that experience, right? Um, for that audience. And so the same thing holds true for marketing. So you have to highly segment your content for each one of those audience. Now that's the 30,000 foot approach. Um, but there'd have to be some research kind of done on each one of those markets to figure out um, what are the cultural mores and values for each one of those markets. Because thumbs up in the United States is cool, but not so much in Japan. It's almost like giving a middle finger. Um, so, you know, you'd have to localize it based upon segmentation. That's the really easy answer. Now you need professionals to help you do that, like a guy like Greg, for instance. Um, to, to, to help you figure that out and then what that what that content looks like for each market. Um, but segmentation would be the key, Ignacio. The short answer is segmentation. Thank you very much. No worries, no worries. Um, anyone else? Um, this is um, a lot of great questions. Cool. Do you guys do you guys do any type of auditing on existing stuff? I know you mentioned it with the content, you know, with clients you're working, you're gonna go in and dig and take a look at what's existing, what's it look at competitors. But if somebody from like ourselves from the outside wanted to maybe get a second set of eyes on what we have or what we might be doing, is that something you guys have available? Yeah, that's what the audit is. It's it's looking at what you are doing. It is a current state analysis. It is a look at it's a look at what you have and then um analyzing it against our POV that we, that we laid out for you today. Analyzing it against how powerful is your brand? Is there a tone? Is there a voice? Is there a purpose there? Are you intentional? Do you have a functional purpose and an intentional purpose? Um, are you segmented? Um, do you have the proper types of content units um, that have different functions? Some content units are for acquisition Others are for brand awareness. Others are for retention and loyalty. Um, you know, how segmented is your audience? And then what are your competitors doing? And then we give you a grade. So yeah, that's what an audit is. We look at what you're currently doing um, and then make recommendations around that. Um, and then, you know, um, create a playbook that you could use as tribal knowledge with your various, um, you know, whoever you have internally, we could show you how to do it. Um, or, you know, we could do it for you. So it just kind of depends on, on where you are. Some folks have pretty mature capabilities internally and all they need is a playbook. They just need to be directed. Um, while other folks um, would rather have someone like Greg um, help guide that process. 
Hey guys, um, this is going really well. So I hate to be that guy to uh, cut things short, but I do have um, a hard stop at one. So I did want to take a chance to um, wrap things up. Thank David and Greg for another fantastic session. Um, and I think the best next steps is probably for me to share uh, your um, respective emails with the founders in case uh, they want to do some follow-ups with you guys. Great. Okay. We'd love to follow up with you guys. Thanks for your time today, guys. Yes, thanks, guys. That, I went by fast. Session. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate you hooking us up again. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Later. Have a nice Tuesday.